All right, hello, my name is Peter Fishman. Um, we're beaming live to you from Springfield, but there's actually even farther west that you can go in Massachusetts, and that's the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts. I usually work there at Berkshire Medical Center, where I'm an attending physician in the emergency department and the associate chair of emergency medicine. I also love when I get the opportunity to work sometimes at Bay State Medical Center, and I feel privileged to be here and privileged to be part of this group of excellent speakers. Our topic today, is emergency CT scan interpretation. Down is forward. Down is forward. It's his clicker. Okay. Um, so emergency CT interpretation. Uh, look, people have a very wide variability in comfort levels when it comes to reading their own CAT scans. Um, you know, uh, Adam Kellogg has uh, pithily named uh, this series of lectures I've been doing, CTs for EMPs, because you know what? You can't always wait for the CAT scan reading from radiology. Um, the variability amongst providers, for some of you this is going to be review. You feel very comfortable looking at your own CT imaging. For a lot of you this is not review and, and you don't feel comfortable. Um, and uh, you'd like to know where to start and how to go about reading your own CAT scans. So that's what this talk is for. Uh, today our installment is abdomen and pelvis. Um, and that's what we're going to focus on. CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis for emergency providers. So quick disclosures, I'm not a radiologist, um, but shouldn't we be learning radiology from radiologists? Well, yes and no. Um, radiologists are definitely the experts. They are without question the authority on interpreting medical imaging. But um, I think that it's important that emergency physicians recognize that we have a different mission and we have a different approach to how we go about uh, interpreting diagnostic imaging, how we use it and what we use it for. So radiologists, for instance, they like a dark, quiet, orderly environment. Um, they have high-resolution monitors. They may be in your building, or they may be on another continent. Um, and that being said, they're one step removed from the immediacy and the humanity of the emergency department and emergency medicine. Their interaction is not with you uh, or with the patient um, or with your colleagues. Their interaction is primarily with the images themselves. Um, and they have a different sense of uh, the urgency of triage and what exactly needs to be read next and how quickly. Different than our understanding of it. They're aiming for comprehensive interpretations. They're aiming for completeness. They may have a very, most radiologists will have a very uh, protocolized way that they look at all abdominal CTs in order not to miss anything. But we, on the other hand, we're, um, we're more frontline people. Uh, we are on the, the bleeding edge of uh, acute care and our work environment is a little bit messier and our needs are a little bit different. Um, the emergency department does not just engage the sense of sight of reading diagnostic images. It's a feast for all five senses. Um, there's lots of interruptions, there's lots of distractions, we have fluorescent lights, we have lower resolution monitors. Our goal isn't always to be just completely comprehensive. We need to integrate all clinical data, the history, the presentation, the physical exam, um, in with the diagnostic imaging to make a diagnosis and to get a treatment plan together and to move things forward. This is what we're sort of aimed at. Sometimes we'll favor speed over completeness uh, because seconds and minutes count in our work environment. Now it's important to realize that radiologists aren't psychic mediums, they're not tarot readers, they're not uh, looking at a crystal ball, they're not reading tea leaves. Radiologists are actually our consultants. Yes, they read diagnostic images, and when it comes to reading diagnostic images, they're unquestionably the experts. Um, but increasingly, when it, you know, in emergency medicine, uh, we're getting more and more comfortable with reading some of our own diagnostic images for our purposes. Um, just think about the 1990s and the rise of sort of point of care ultrasound. Uh, bedside ultrasound and emergency medicine. The idea that emergency physicians can gather discrete, you know, actionable information in real time on a discrete clinical question um, and act on that information through their own interpretation of the imaging. It's important to know that our limitations are that these are very discrete and focused and limited questions and answers that we're coming to and that we need our radiologists for comprehensive readings uh, and the role they play is exceedingly important. But we do also have a role to play 
uh, in the interpretation of diagnostic imaging. So uh, we learned that very well from um, point of care ultrasound. So when emergency physicians get involved with reading images, I think everybody wins. Uh, what this talk will not include. Um, no radiologist, uh, not a lot of jargon. I'm not going to pull images from Google Images and show them to you slice by slice um, with arrows. Um, I'm really going to give you uh, a different take on things. Um, I can't teach you how to read CT scans like a radiologist. I don't know how they read CAT scans, really. But perhaps it's not the goal. Perhaps the goal isn't to read CAT scans like a radiologist. Perhaps the goal is to read CAT scans like emergency providers and physicians and advanced practice providers. Hopefully I can show you a few useful tips you can bring with you to your next shift. This talk will include an emergency medicine mindset, an emergency medicine approach, uh, some tips and pearls from recent cases from my shop, Berkshire Medical Center, uh, that have been anonymized, things that we've seen over the past couple weeks. It'll include my totally subjective opinions that are not backed up by any literature, data, or anything uh, validated at all. Uh, we're going to look at some cases together, as if we're working together in the emergency department, waiting for the radiologist report, waiting eagerly, but really trying to figure out what can we diagnose on our own right now. To do this, we'll have to review some physics, some organic chemistry, a few equations. Um, actually, no, we don't have to do that. Uh, we should at least, though, look and review some basic principles of CT imaging. Anatomy, I'm sure everybody tuning in, I don't have to review anatomy with you, um, but the core principles of density, windowing, and planes are really important, so let's go over that quickly. Um, so, forget 50 shades of gray. There's really only about 30 that the human eye can really decipher between, and um, that becomes very important when looking at grayscale images on CAT scan. Um, for any of you interested in medical history, Sir Godfrey Hounsfield, um, I, don't know. I don't know if anybody is uh, interested, uh, British electrical engineer came up with this uh, scale to rate, um, to rate uh, shades of gray from uh, negative 1,000, which is air, which is the least possible density, to uh, 1,000, uh, positive 1,000, which is you know, calcified bone, which is the greatest possible density, and somewhere in the middle is uh, water. Um, now, it's important to understand the, the concept of windowing. I think that everybody's um, familiar with, well, let's look at the brain windows. Let's look at the lung windows. Um, well, what does that mean, really? And that's represented here on the slide by um, the yellow brackets that are just really uh, encompassing one smaller segment of the Hounsfield scale. That smaller segment, in this case, it's probably just abdominal uh, windows here. Um, is having the computer focus on some of the, the grays only within the tissue of interest to bring out more subtle differences in density that are apparent to the human eye. So by focusing in on just a smaller window of the larger Hounsfield scale, you bring different aspects of what you're looking for to light and give it greater clarity to the human eye. And that's what windowing is. I mean, everybody's heard of um, fat stranding. What is fat stranding? Well, fat stranding is that, you know, um, when fat gets edematous, um, it takes on a little bit more of the density of water. Uh, when it's inflamed, when it's angry, when it's upset, it gets a little bit more dense, and therefore uh, stranding is something that we see because the grayscale has embraced a little bit more of the water than the fat, and that gives us some differential contrast on the CAT scan and brings it to life. Literally, windowing correctly will make the difference between you seeing something and you're missing it. So be com comfortable with, with window and use the correct windows. A word about IV contrast. This is another game changer. And this is another, uh, this is another way that we enhance things uh, selectively. Except this time it's all about timing, right? So this is an intravenous product that uh, goes into the bloodstream and you want to capture it. You want to capture the images when that contrast is sitting in the area that you're most wanting to look at. So. You know, this is very obvious to some, but to, to just say it uh, outright, if you want to look for an aortic dissection, you want to make sure that the IV contrast is in the aorta. So it's going to be captured, and you want to grab those images while the IV contrast is sitting there. Likewise, if you've got a trauma patient, you want to make sure that the IV contrast is in the solid organs. Perhaps you want to look for splenic injury, solid organ injury. You want to see a blush if there's some extravasation of contrast. You want to make sure that you capture those images while that contrast is perfusing the solid organs. Likewise, diverticulitis. Let's make sure that the contrast, when we grab the images, are in the colon, in the 
adjacent mesentery and will light up and give us that fat stranding, which is going to help us make the diagnosis. Likewise, bladder injury. You, know, you want to wait until all that contrast is actually filtered through the kidneys and developed its, you know, centered itself in the urinary bladder and get delayed images so that with the contrast in the bladder, you can see potential bladder injury or masses within the bladder. Is contrast always necessary? That's a talk for a different time. Uh, what requires contrast, what doesn't? But outside of uh, uh, limited indications, most times IV contrast is going to benefit you in terms of bringing out uh, pathology and what you're interested in. If you're not sure, just call. Call your consultant, call your radiologist, call your CT technologist. They will be very helpful if you describe to them what you're looking to find and they'll help you put in the right order for the right scan. All right, so spatial conventions. Remember to use proper spatial conventions. This is the language of medical imaging, you know, coronal, sagittal, axial, um, proximal, distal, cephalad, caudal, anterior, posterior. These are the terminology that everybody has agreed upon to use. You want to be able to uh, uh, describe your findings to others, to the consultants, to the surgeon who's sitting at home. You don't want to be the physician in the emergency department who's calling the surgeon at 3 o'clock in the morning saying something like, you know, there's some schmutz on top of the, you know, the what's it called. Okay, nobody wants to be that emergency room physician. You shouldn't want to be that emergency room physician. So know your anatomy, know your planes, know your spatial conventions so that you can describe your findings to others. All right. So are we ready to look at some images? Not so fast. Slow your scroll. You see what I did there? Okay, uh, before you begin scrolling through your images, uh, there's some items that I'd like you to keep in mind. Uh, first things first. Uh, do you have the correct patient, okay? The, the physician before you uh, or the APP before you uh, came to the computer, left some images up. Sometimes we're busy, sometimes we're distracted. Do you have the correct patient? Is this today's scan or are you looking at a comparison film? Um, what plane are we in? Which windows uh, are we using? Where do we want to start? Um, is this a contrast study? Is this a non-contrast study? What phase is the contrast in? Um, is there a comparison study available? Um, believe me, there's not a radiologist who's going to look at one of your CAT scans without a comparison study if one is available. And you shouldn't be looking at one without a comparison study either. All right. Some other things to keep in mind before we look at some images. Take stock of your own cognitive biases. So your patient comes in, a uh, middle-aged person, left lower quadrant pain, history of di diverticulitis. You're expecting to see di diverticulitis. How does that affect your interpretation of a thickened colon wall? How does that your, affect your interpretation of the scan? You know, if, when a physician decides in advance that they're looking for something, their tendency to find that thing when they're looking at the test is known as confirmation bias. And that will really affect you. Another bias that will frequently affect us when we look at our own imaging, because we know so much about the patient already, is, um, is premature closure bias. Think about it. Uh, all right, I'm scanning through quickly. Uh, I see an ovarian cyst on this, you know, very difficult to deal with patient who has pelvic pain. They're always here with pelvic pain. There's the ovarian cyst. Done. Okay. What you didn't do was take the time to be comprehensive enough to notice that there's actually a stone at the UVJ. Um, so be aware of your own uh, potential for bias. Uh, most radiologists that I've spoken to, they don't even look at the patient complaint prior to doing their reading. They will do their protocolized reading as not to bias themselves, then go back, look at the reason for the exam, and then zero in on the complaint on, on your order. And that's simply uh, because they're aware of this. You can, you can find things uh, or not find things depending on your own biases. You know, the most frequently missed finding on CT can be the one that you just weren't looking for. Um, but you also want to utilize the patient presentation and exam to your advantage. You, you know, unlike the radiologist, you've had the opportunity to see the patient, take the history, do a detailed exam, you know where it hurts. You know where the bruising is, you know where the swelling is, you know where the real tenderness is or the crepitus. You can use that to your advantage and really uh, do a better interpretation than you would otherwise. You can also leverage your knowledge of injury patterns and disease. Um, for instance, we, we know that uh, you know, you're rarely going to find one pubic ramus that's fractured, so it's going to clue you in that you need to look at the other. Elderly patients tend not to have you know, one isolated rib fracture. Very often there will be subtle perhaps non-displaced rib fractures adjacent. Um, there's lots of things that you know from, from emergency medicine that you can apply to the way that you look at CAT scans. All right, so we're gonna play, not name that tune, but name that abdominal pelvic 
pathology. In this format where we're being recorded, I don't have a, you know, an audience who can raise their hand or buzz in, but I would invite you to play along with me at home. All right, let's get started reading some images together as if we're together in the emergency department. We're waiting for a reading to come back from radiology. We'll start out with, uh, okay, 29-year-old male with right lower quadrant abdominal pain. Um, you know, some people, especially if you're not familiar with doing this, some people say, well, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, and while we're not going to have a completely systematic way of looking at these things, I think we all learn to read chest x-rays uh, beginning with a very protocolized method of reading chest x-rays and then eventually we got a little bit more of a gestalt of how these things are supposed to look. A lot of this is pattern recognition so for the uninitiated uh, we'll go a little bit more systematic through this. What you start with and generally what you receive first are extra abdominal structures. You start with the lung bases and the heart. So you can take a look down here and sort of say okay this is um, an axial slice uh, sort of at the cranial end of the, um, of the uh, scan. And you're going to start here at the lung bases, and you're going to be looking at the lung bases and, of course, at the heart and the pericardium. And as you come down, lung bases look fairly clear. There's no uh, fluid really surrounding the heart. There's no pericardial effusion or tamponade there as you look. And I think most emergency physicians are used to looking at a lot of ultrasounds, maybe not as many CAT scans. But as you come down, you can also then move past the uh, uh, thoracic structure, start to look at the abdominal structures, look at um, uh, the, the, the texture of the liver. Is it, is it homogeneous? Can you see the uh, collecting system, the, uh, uh, the venous system? Take a look now at the uh, spleen and make sure that you have a good uh, homogeneous texture to the spleen and that it doesn't look um, uh, abnormal or enlarged. Um, you'll get a sense for this as you look at more and more of these. Now you come down to more solid organs. The, the kidneys uh, are coming into view here on the screen and you can scroll up and down through those and say, see that they look symmetric and that you don't see any obvious hydronephrosis or anything. And as you come down you're also going to be seeing other retroperitoneal structures of, uh, you know, anterior to the kidneys like the pancreas which, which comes across. Uh, so you'll move um, now caudal uh, uh, down the scan and you can sort of start to look at hollow viscous. So I like to start all the way down in the pelvis with the hollow viscous. I mean, you can tell right away that you're dealing with a male patient, right? Not because of the genitalia are present, but because the patient has a prostate. Um, and as you go more cranial, um, you start to see the rectum come into view. Right? And you follow the rectum uh, cranially, and you start to see the sigmoid colon sort of snake its way through the pelvis. And then you can get a look at the large bowel and the small bowel. You can get a look at the mesentery uh, and make sure that the mesenteric fat uh, looks nice and dark the way fat should on a Hounsfield scale. Uh, should look very dark. Um, other things to keep in mind is after you've looked at the organs and the intra-abdominal contents, look at things that you don't consider traditionally part of intra-abdominal contents. Start to look at the, um, start to look at the uh, extra... Uh, uh, sort of uh, abdominal fat and the soft tissues, start to look at the bones. You may want to throw on bone windows and take a look at the bones and you're going to get a more comprehensive view that way. So here we are, we've, we've talked about maybe some basics. Oh, and don't forget, of course, you've got your vasculature. I don't do a whole lot. I'm not going to tell you if a patient really has uh, portal venous thrombosis most times. I'm not going to see that unless a radiologist brings my attention to that. Um, but I will check the caliber of the aorta and most patients, especially elderly patients, coming in with abdominal pain as I scroll uh, caudal. So um, that's a quick gestalt run through. So now we have a 29-year-old male, comes in with abdominal pain. I did my gestalt run through. I've checked uh, most structures, but really uh, I was concerned because the patient had some periumbilical and, and some right lower quadrant tenderness, and this is really an appendicitis scan. So how do you find the appendix? This is one of those things that there's a lot of uh, talk about. Um, I think it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You're not going to find the appendix every time. Your radiologist isn't going to find the appendix every time. Um, but it, there's a straightforward way of finding it that's going to work for you in most cases and give you a jump on the case before you get your radiology report back. So you're going to look at the descending colon here. Uh, I'm sorry, on the ascending colon here on the patient's right on the left of your screen. And uh, you're going to follow it caudal um, down to the cecum. Okay? And you're going to see that here. So again, we're going to come down, you know, where all the poop is, right? So we're going to come down to the cecum, which is kind of large caliber, large bowel um, at the tail end of the, uh, uh, of the um, ascending colon. And then you're going to uh, take a look at this structure right here. 
So this is the, uh, believe it or not, as I scroll through this, um, you start to get a, you're going to start to get used to seeing where the ilium meets the cecum. The terminal ilium or the ileocecal valve always has this strange sort of swirly appearance to it. Um, and it's generally attached right to the cecum. That's your landmark, okay? And you're going to see that in most cases right here. You've got your ileocecal valve. And generally on the same sort of aspect of the cecum that the ileocecal valve uh, uh, enters, you're also going to see the takeoff of the appendix. When a patient has an appendix, when the appendix is visible. And that takeoff can happen sort of posteriorly, it can go kind of toward the midline. Um, it's a little hard to find which direction it's going, but you'll start to get used to finding it. And in this patient, as, as we go down, I'm, okay, is this it? Here's something. Well, okay, there's a loop of something. Okay, but that that's continuous with bowel. That's, that's a piece of, of, of small intestine. That's not actually your appendix because it doesn't have a blind end. It just continues. And it's not on the same aspect of the cecum as the, uh, as the ileocecal valve. But as we go a little bit caudal, oh, here's something, right? Right here, here's something. Now, let's see if that thing has an end. And, as we, oh, yes, it does. This thing is a blind-ended <laughs> structure, uh, blind-ended bowel structure located uh, uh, right at the cecum, coming off of the cecum, on the same aspect of the cecum as the uh, ileocecal valve. So to me, this is, a, this is a, uh, the appendix um, uh, to my uh, lesser trained eye than a radiologist, but I'm going to call that this is the appendix. And you know what, if you're not so sure, uh, like in, when we're doing bedside ultrasound, what do we do if we're not sure that we're getting what we need to see? We do another window. And in CT, you then move to another plane. The coronal plane is a great comparison to see if is what I'm seeing really the appendix, and we'll go there in a second. But here, what you can start to see is, if this is indeed our appendix, this patient has appendicitis. Because if you were to measure this uh, in the PAX uh, software, this appendix has a caliber of about a centimeter, which is uh, large, and uh, too large to be normal. And what you see is this grayish haze around the appendix, see this fat here around the appendix? Right here, this hazy fat. It's very different than this fat right here, which is dark and black. This is stranding. This is fat stranding. This is edematous, angry, inflamed fat. So um, this to me is appendicitis. It's uh, coming off, the, uh, uh, off of the cecum. It's enlarged. It's inflamed. It's edematous. It's blind-ended. Um, I'm going to be giving this patient antibiotics perioperatively and I'm going to, kind of going to call the surgeon. They may say to you, well, is the reading back on the CAT scan? And you're going to say, no, <laughs> but um, I'm putting my nickel down and this is acute appendicitis. Now, to convince yourself further, you may want to go to the coronal views like I was, I was mentioning. Let's see if we can bring those up. So coronal, right? So this is the plane that does slices like this. Um, this is going to show you, as you come anterior to posterior, this is going to show you your abdominal muscles, uh, very fit abdominal muscles, uh, as they would appear on CT, and they're going to start to go more and more po posterior. And as we were talking about earlier, you can get a better sense of the kidneys in coronal. Uh, you can just sort of see that the symmetry, the collecting system shows up really well in this view. Um, but we're here to look at the appendix, so we're going to go to the right lower quadrant. So here is ascending colon. Okay, that we're going to follow down to the cecum, okay? And we're going to see that terminal ilium, that swirl here, the ileocecal valve that we talked about as your landmark. And then right off the same aspect, you're going to see the appendix take off. And as we scroll through the appendix, here you are. There's the blind end of the appendix, and it articulates with the cecum. That's your appendix, and it's enlarged, it's inflamed. Yes, it is what you saw in the axial slices. This patient does have acute appendicitis. Um, now, in terms of that bias of premature closure or confirmation, you know, the patient is 29, male, has right lower quadrant tenderness. I already thought this was going to be appendicitis. It's good to make sure that you go through um, the rest of the, the scan with the same sort of uh, systematic uh, view as we discussed earlier. So that's, that's abdominal pain, uh, acute appendicitis, and the axial and the coronal slices. Um, so let's move on. 65-year-old male with abdominal pain and vomiting. Um, again, we're going to look at the uh, lung bases and the uh, heart. Uh, clearly, this is not as young or healthy of a patient as our last scan, but um, 
nothing too out of the ordinary on the lung basis or the heart. Um, we're going to move down to uh, check, check the liver uh, and the texture of the liver and the spleen, the solid organs. Whoa, whoa, right? So what jumps out at you immediately? We get these giant loops of bowel. Um, this is not normal. There's a problem here. Um, and I think that that's going to jump out at you right away. This, this probably has a lot to do with why your patient's uncomfortable, why they presented to the emergency department. So these giant loops of bowel, you also see oral contrast. So this is a, this is a scan that not only has intravenous contrast, the way that you can see the kidneys enhancing here, the patient received uh, intravenous contrast, but this patient got oral contrast and it doesn't really go that far. It certainly doesn't go t as, as low as the colon and the rectum. Um, which uh, are massively dilated with no oral contrast. So we're really looking at something very suspicious for an obstruction here. Uh, small bowel obstruction, or maybe large bowel obstruction. Is this small bowel or large bowel? Well, let's look at the coronal and get a little bit more information. Before we do, again, when I do run the bowel, I tend to look from uh, the uh, caudal space uh, up to cranial. So here's your um, rectum, and it's coming up into the pelvis here as you follow it. And then, I don't know if you can see this, but it's like really small caliber here, the sigmoid colon, and then <laughs> there's this kind of bottleneck, okay? So I, that, that just looks to me, I'm not expecting that emergency physicians will always find transition points of obstructed patients, but I do think that it's useful to look at this one because it goes, as you go from caudal to cranial, it's small bowel, it's small caliber, and then all of a sudden you have a, a choke point and this big, big uh, uh, caliber bit of what is probably large bowel, if, if we're looking at it correctly. So moving to the, and, and try to ignore the yellow line through this. Um, uh, looking at the bowel here, you can start to see, uh, it measures out um, at about eight and a half centimeters. Now with bowel obstruction, I tend to use like the three, six, nine rule, which is very simplified. Three centimeters is kind of the upper limit of normal for small bowel, six centimeters is the upper limit of, of normal for diameter of large bowel, nine, you know, you can be a little bit more generous with the cecum um, or with the sigmoid, it can be up to nine. But in this case, you've got large bowel, which is two and a half centimeters uh, bigger than it ought to be. And you can tell it's large bowel because you can start to see in the coronal plane, which you couldn't see as well in the axial, you can see the haustra uh, come into view here. So you have a large bowel obstruction here. And as you come down, uh, uh, so from anterior to posterior, um, you can start to follow the, uh, the colon upward again, uh, cranially. And here you go. Here's your choke point. Very small caliber, choke point, large caliber, and into these giant, giant loops. So this is an example of actually a sigmoid volvulus uh, on CT scan. Um, and... Um, I think that at this point, I'm not waiting for a radiology report. Um, I'm calling my interventionalist. I'm talking about the possibility that they're going to need uh, to be uh, addressed in the operating room or endoscopically. And I'm not waiting. I'm moving uh, uh, because I think that this is a time-dependent condition, and I'm going to get my consultant on board right away. All right, so that's 65-year-old man. Moving on. 28-year-old man with gunshot wound to the left buttock. Let's look at this one. All right, so again, lung bases, pericardium, solid organs. Um, coming through here, uh, this is the stomach. Okay, this is not an obstruction. This is just a full stomach, okay? And you'll start to get to get a feel for what these things look like on CT. That's not pathologic. Um, but as you start to come uh, craniocaudally, you're going to see some things that don't make much sense. Like, what is this garbage here? Right? This stuff here, these dots with no no density at all, there's air. Okay, so maybe on our exam, we knew that there was an entrance wound right here, okay? Uh, you got a radio opaque foreign body. This is some air tracking into the soft tissues. Maybe this is a, uh, maybe this is a, uh, uh, you know, the, the trajectory, the, the, the path of the, of the projectile. And there's also a whole bunch of, of um, air in place, places where we, we wouldn't expect it, not just in the soft tissue, but I don't know, is this air uh, adjacent to the colon intraluminal? And as we go even farther caudally, um, what is this? Is the bladder, but what's posterior to the bladder? Um, well, that's free fluid and that's fairly dense. I'm not gonna calculate the Hounsfield units on it. It's fairly dense. Gunshot victim, free air uh, next to the colon, some fluid in the pelvis. Uh, that's blood until proven otherwise. Um, 
you know, males should never have any significant visible free fluid uh, unless, you know, except for in cases of ascites and things like that. Um, so this is abnormal and, and I've got some concerns. Oh, now check this out. You've got some air tracking up this way um, through the soft tissues up here. Oh, and you might have an exit wound right up here with this radio opaque foreign body. So you can start to appreciate the trajectory of this projectile. You can imagine that you've got some significant injuries to the bowel. You know that you've got some bleeding into the pelvis. You know where this is headed and you don't have to wait for the reading to go there. So um, we're going to be getting this patient perioperative antibiotics. And uh, if you're in a shop that already has trauma surgeons, they're ready for you. But many of you don't. And this is when you're going to be calling your, your surgeon to get out of bed. Or if you don't have that resource, you're going to be calling for transport of this patient to a tertiary care center. Now, the, um, the radiologists know uh, that it's really useful when you're judging free air to look, this is the same patient, but they will generally include in their series, they'll include lung windows for the whole abdomen. You may want to put it on lung windows because, because lungs are air spaces, essentially, they focus on that spectrum of the Hounsfield scale that looks for air, and they're going to bring more uh, uh, focus to air. So as you kind of come from uh, cranial to caudal, this might jump out at you here, okay? There's no reason for a pocket of air to rise into the anterior portion of the abdomen unless the patient has free air. You know, you can even see a sliver of it here. And as you move uh, caudally again, um, you can see there's... So this is a good uh, demonstration. This is intraluminal air, okay? That is within a loop of bowel. This is extraluminal air. And it doesn't come through if you look at one slice in a presentation. But as you go through it, you can start to see where these air droplets are. Likewise, there's some air that comes uh, into the anterior uh, uh, extra abdominal portion of the soft tissue. And again, down near the colon, as we saw before, now that we're windowing it differently, you can start to see the air here in the soft tissue and the air tracking along the uh, descending colon. So this patient is probably going to wind up with a colostomy. Okay, moving on. All right, 72 year old male, uh, MBC obtundent. Okay, so in this case, you don't get a whole lot of history. Uh, you don't get a very accurate physical exam. Um, so you're gonna have to be a little bit more systematic with your approach. Uh, I'm gonna move on and just sort of say that as you go through this, uh, you're not gonna see a whole lot of, um, whole lot of pathology. There's definitely a whole lot of uh, stool uh, filling the, the colon, um, but that's uh, an incidental finding. Uh, there's not going to be a whole lot here. Um, so this is an MBC patient, so I'm looking very specifically at the liver. Uh, there's some venous congestion there. I don't see anything all that abnormal. The, 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 the kidneys, these, uh, you know, okay, well, there's something. So, okay, I don't really need to describe the, the simple cyst on the patient's left kidney. I'll leave that to the radiologist. Um, or the calcification of the aorta, I'm going to leave that to the radiologist. This high stool burden, I'm also going to not really care about. Uh, I'm looking for traumatic injuries. Um, so, uh, as we come down, you know, not much in the abdomen. And if you look you know, systematically, you may then want to move on to your bone windows. This is the same patient with the bone windows. Again, I'm going to be looking very closely with an elderly patient at multiple rib fractures. Um, and I'll just tell you that I, I haven't seen any here as I put this, this uh, uh, presentation together. Um, but as you come down and you really start to look at the, um, the, the sacrum and the uh, iliacs, you'll start to see as you come down... Um, Right here. Does any, everybody see this? Uh, this is a minimally displaced femoral neck fracture to me. Um, and this is one of those classic fractures that doesn't always project well on an AP uh, radiograph in the trauma bay. Uh, and that's one of those things. If I'm shipping a patient to Bay State from the Berkshires, if I send them a patient on a backboard and I have uh, not diagnosed that they have a, an acute uh, hip fracture, I've really done them a disservice. It's very important that I do everything that I can to give them an accurate sign out, an accurate report, and tell them what I've got. And in this case, the patient does have an acute uh, minimally displaced femoral neck fracture. So it pays to, well, and he's clearly got these, uh, these nails from a previous um, procedure on his opposite hip. It pays to go through the bone windows, especially when you can't get a good history or exam. Be thorough. 62-year-old female, epigastric pain and vomiting. We'll go through 
a few of these images. Again, lung bases, heart, pericardium, solid organs. Um, the first thing as, as we move through here that jumps out at me as I looked at this case was right up here, okay? So again, let's look through that. Okay, here's another thing that jumps out at you, right? There's a simple renal cyst there. I'll let the radiologist um, describe that. Um, but I've got a 62-year-old lady with a lot of abdominal pain and vomiting. Um, this, to me, is a target sign. Uh, and we know from, from ultrasound uh, uh, also that, you know, this is uh, kind of pathognomonic for an intussusception. And this uh, patient... Um, as you move along, has an intussusception. For reasons why you don't want to have premature closure, certainly, I guess there's other potential causes of the patient's uh, acute abdominal pain other than intussusception. So it pays to at least scroll through the rest of the scan, maybe look at your other windows, maybe look at another plane, but that's an example of intussusception. 41-year-old male, epigastric pain. Um, it's just another uh, uh, example. Um, clean lung bases, clear pericardium, um, looking good in terms of the, the texture of the liver and the spleen, the symmetry of the uh, kidneys. But wait a minute. All of a sudden, I'm noticing some garbage up in here. Is anybody seeing that? All right, this does not look like this peritoneal. Th this does not like, look like this peritoneal fat. This looks really edematous, really angry, really inflamed. Um, this is a lot of fat straining and probably some edema and fluid. Um, and where is it? Okay, it's anterior to the kidney. Um, it's kind of right at the head of the pancreas. So here's a patient that before I, I may not even have my life pace back, um, but I'm very suspicious at this point that this patient has a lot of edema and a lot of uh, uh, stranding and, um, uh, in, the, in the area of the pancreatic head. So this is a patient that I'm starting to get very concerned for acute pancreatitis. I scroll through the rest of the, the images. Hopefully I look in more than one plane and that's the only abnormality I see. And I'm gonna to start to disposition and treat this patient as if he has acute pancreatitis as evidenced by all of this inflammation and edema right at the head of the pancreas, acute pancreatitis. I'm trying not to go through these too fast or too slow, um, but we just have a couple more. Um, all right, so 36-year-old male brought in by EMS groaning, another problematic physical examination. Um, so I'm gonna have to look pretty systematically. I'm looking at lung bases, I'm looking at solid organs. Whoa, have we seen this before in this presentation? No. So <laughs> there's something uh, wrapping its way around the kidney and uh, around the liver and around the spleen on the other side. Okay, this is a problem. Um, I'm not gonna calculate out the Hounsfield units. I haven't committed them to memory, what represents blood, what represents you know, um, more simple fluid or different types of fluid. But in, in a 36-year-old MVC patient who's groaning and has altered mental status, I'm gonna assume this is blood. Um, but I'm gonna look through it more closely. Uh, I see this uh, kind of coming around throughout the abdomen. And you, you could tell if you were to do an, a FAST exam, this patient has the same you know, uh, high density fluid in Morrison's pouch. So um, this is a patient who would have a positive fast exam, of course, and you can see the fluid collecting the paracolic gutters, which you would expect, they're dependent areas of the abdomen, and into the pelvis. Um, so here's a whole lake of free fluid. So I haven't gotten a radiology report. I don't even know if the images have made it to the radiologist. Maybe I'm standing in the CT scanner with the patient on the gantry and I'm just looking over the shoulder of my CT tech. I'm seeing this and I know a few things already. I'm gonna to have to resuscitate this patient. I'm gonna to have to call in a trauma team or a surgeon um, and I may have to transfer this patient or they may have to prepare to do some damage control surgery and then transfer the patient. Now, when you're looking for the source of this bleeding, you know, when you look at the, the, the texture of the spleen on this side, you gotta say, compared to the other spleens that we've looked at today, this does not look good, right? So you've got some uh, kind of mixed density stuff mixing into the spleen, splenic parenchyma. I, I don't know how to grade radi radiologically a, a splenic injury. What I do know is that it looks like this patient has hemoperitoneum uh, from an acute splenic injury from his MVC. He's bleeding and I'm gonna have to resuscitate him and probably plan some intervention or some very close surgical uh, uh, observation of the patient at my institution or another. So there's um, an example of hemoperitoneum and a splenic injury. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, moving on. 
All right, so 50-year-old male, severe sepsis, maybe he's, uh, maybe he's got a soft blood pressure, uh, you've got some concerns for this patient, and he's got flank pain, and you don't have a source yet. Um, just to be as quick as we can about this, this is uh, uh, how we come craniocaudal, and the first thing that jumps out at me, hopefully it also jumps out at you, is there's some asymmetry between these two kidneys, okay? The kidney on the right, the collecting system looks normal. The kidney on the left looks abnormal. This will become more apparent in the coronal views. Um, and as you follow this uh, sort of caudally, inferiorly, this is um, going to terminate in a stone in the mid ureter. So let's go over that in a little bit more detail. You can follow the collecting system um, caudally down to the ureter, right? So does everybody see the takeoff of the ureter here? There it is. Now, in contrast, this is the takeoff of the ureter on the normal side. Look at how small that ureter is right here. Look at how big this ureter is. All right, you don't have to be a radiologist to see that and to know what you're, you're dealing with as you come down. Now this calcification, we're gonna call it a stone. It's, it's not occurring in the pelvis. It's probably not a flebolith or a fake out or a calcification somewhere else. Is that a stone? You've got um, generously um, sort of sort of uh, swollen hydroureter, hydronephrosis, then you've got a very calcified obstruction, and then distal, the caliber of the ureter goes back to normal and it rides its way down the psoas muscle into the bladder. So here you are, you haven't gotten your, uh, your radiology report, but what you do have is um, a working diagnosis and a working source of severe sepsis in a patient who may need a um, percutaneous nephrostomy too. This is the coronal view, and you can see um, everybody who practices bedside ultrasound knows what mild hydronephrosis looks like in a kidney. There it is. Uh, it's the same patient, of course. And here's the takeoff of the ureter, which is very generous, too big, not, not the same size as the other one, which is here. This one is awfully large. And then uh, as you come down, you'll see here's your stone. Um, so I hope you can see that. That's, so that's, that's an obstructed stone causing um, severe sepsis and septic shock in a patient. It's going to change your management. Last one, 67-year-old female. Oh, no, second to last one. Um, this one is just abbreviated. I'm really just giving you an example of uh, diverticulitis. Um, you notice as you're coming into the pelvis that already this mesenteric fat does not look like the other mesenteric fat. It's not nice and dark and sort of uh, clean looking. This is very angry looking. And you come to this slide here and you actually get to see ticks. These are diverticulosis, right? So these are your little outpouchings of the, of the sigmoid colon that are going to... Um, they're going to clue you into the fact that the patient does have diverticulosis and may be at risk for diverticulitis. And so coming down, you see all this angry inflammation, signs of inflammation and infection. You know the patient has ticks. And then on this shot, you really get to see just how thick the wall of the colon is and how inflamed. This little lumen in the center is nothing compared to these thick, thickened uh, uh, walls of the sigmoid colon. So thick sigmoid colon, diverticulosis, fat stranding, um, this patient has acute diverticulitis. I'm treating that patient. I'm even going to disposition that patient based on my preliminary read while I wait for the radiologist's official report. Finally, 83-year-old female, far from standing lower abdominal pain. It's just worth showing that uh, we didn't really go through the sagittal, uh, but remember that it's very helpful to go through the sagittal, especially for bone windows. For this lady who's having lower abdominal pain and you have no other source, looking at the sagittal uh, views is very helpful. Because um, what you can start to see, it's difficult to determine, determine the chronicity of some of these uh, injuries. Um, so it's good to have a comparison film. But here you see the superior end plate here looks nice and crisp. This one, not so much. And we're at five, four, three. L2, the superior end plate of L2 is fractured. Okay, it doesn't look nice and flat like this. It doesn't even look nice and flat like this or like this. It's fractured. And uh, the patient is having radicular pain to the lower abdomen and, and groin area as a result of radicular pain. You know, as you look through here, you can also check. It's not as good, of course, as MRI, but you can see that there's no major retropulsion from this fractured superior end plate of L2. Um, but it is fractured, and it could certainly cause radicular pain. So, bringing it home, some CT scan findings are too important to wait for a radiology report. Other findings would simply benefit from early recognition and a treatment plan that you institute early. 
Motivated emergency physicians can develop the skills to reliably diagnose important pathology on CT scan. So how do you do it? I didn't learn to read CTs during my residency. How do I build these skills? Pattern recognition. It's very similar to the way that we develop our ability to read EKGs. You look at it over and over and over again, and patterns start to emerge. It doesn't require that much brain power. It just requires repetition. Look at every CT scan you order and then read the body, not just the impression, okay, of every single CT report. There is so much good learning buried into the body of every CT uh, report. That's where you're going to learn. Read the whole thing. Be that person who reads the whole thing. Talk to your radiologists as consultants. Hey, there are going to be times where you see something that the radiologist doesn't, or you think you see something. That's okay. That's good care. Call the radiologist. Ask them. Talk to them. Hey, did you see this? And they'll be like, oh, I saw that, but that's not what you think it is. This is why. You just learned something. Use your radiologist as the expert consultants that they are. Speak their language, and they're going to teach you. By building your CT interpretation skills, you're going to arrive at the diagnosis faster. You're going to initiate treatment earlier. You're going to provide higher quality care. You're going to save lives, and you'll be a better emergency physician. Thank you all very much for your attention. Enjoy the rest of this conference.